Thank you, David and uh, Scott and, and, you know, the America's Future Series for the, um, for the opportunity. Uh, you know, we were focused on doing the next best thing um, and the next right thing uh, for United States and, and freedom uh, and democracy around the world. And that's what these discussions are all about. And it is my honor and privilege to uh, introduce and welcome uh, Representative Jonathan Larkin, two-time Marine, uh, two uh, terms in the Arizona State Legislature, uh, uh, multiple degrees, uh, most recently in global management from uh, the Thunderbird School of Global Management. Uh, and he will be uh, leading a panel uh, uh, discussing uh, space policy, uh, particularly uh, the interplay of policy and the emerging space economy. Uh, Jonathan, thank you for joining us and, and taking the time to, to host this discussion. Uh, welcome. I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce uh, yourself uh, and the panel further. Thank you, Zuhir. Uh, thanks for the, the kind intro. And uh, thanks to the panelists for being here today. Um, before I get started, I just want to take a moment and uh, allow everybody to introduce themselves really quickly. So um, I'll go ahead and uh, so how about how about you, Tim Yubi, since ASU love. So we'll start with you. Um, it looks like she might be having a bit of uh, technical difficulties. Maybe uh, move over to um, uh, Professor Ja or, or Dr. Goswami. Dr. Goswami, go ahead, take the lead. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. It's a real pleasure to be here and an honor. So uh, I work on space policy and space futures uh, and mostly looking at Asia, the rise of Asia. But I also study how US uh, space policy and posture affects geopolitics and astropolitics. And very recently, I co-authored a book with Peter Garretson on Scramble for the Skies, the Great Park Competition to Control the Resources of Outer Space. I'm looking forward to our discussion today. Thank you for having me. Thanks. And uh, Dr. Maribaja? Yeah, so Maribaja, uh, Associate Professor of Aerospace Engineering and Engineering Mechanics at the University of Texas at Austin. I lead a transdisciplinary research program in uh, space safety, security, and sustainability, uh, really trying to quantify, assess, and predict uh, the behavior of human-made anthropogenic uh, space objects in the context uh, of space safety, security, and sustainability. Awesome. Thank you. And where is, is Tim Yebi? I think she's uh, still having technical difficulties. We'll get her in as soon as we can. Okay. Well, um, all right. Well, before we get started, so I got to know if we're, if we're traveling the space, what would be your chosen in flight movie? Mine? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, probably Dune. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. June? You said June? Yeah. Yeah. The original one, not this whole remake stuff. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Please. <laughs> Dr. Goswami, how about you? So for me, it would be 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, oh, I love it. And influenced by that movie and the impact it had. So yes, that would be it. Fantastic. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and jump right into it. Um, so the first question I have, and, and feel free, just there are no ground rules or anything. It's just going to be open discussion. So um, whoever wants to address it, go ahead and just jump right in. Um, first question is, how is the U.S. positioned uh, itself globally, and what, are, what, what is our immediate need in order to safely and secure and lead uh, for the rest of the world? Uh, thank you, Dr. Chow. So uh, that was a great question to start off with. So uh, what I'd like to do is talk a bit about space policy in general. So space policy, uh, especially for the benefit of the audience, is the direction that the government adopts to achieve particular end goals and why. And I think the why is critical because when you talk about government space agencies in the US and across the world, you're talking about taxpayers' money. So it's very important to identify that. And usually when it comes to space, investments tend to be long-term in terms of space technology. 
Now, one of the things that is again important to realize is that, especially when you see with what we discuss about COVID-19, that space infrastructure is actually very soon becoming critical infrastructure. And so last year, the China National Development and Reform Commission highlighted space as a critical infrastructure, which means that it gets priority in terms of investment. Now your question, is the US well positioned? I would think the US is well positioned, but the question is whether it'll take advantage of that particular position, which means identifying uh, key policy areas, which areas to actually compete in, which areas to actually cooperate in, and then to chart a very spirited course as to how you get there to that particular goal. Now, the important point again is that within the context that we are talking today, it's no more the Cold War. It's no more the 1960s and the 70s where you had a very few spacefaring nations. The mm -hmm. world has changed. There are so many different nations, there are private entities. And so in that context, does the US have a very clear goal in terms of its space ambitions that actually inspires others to join in. And so I would say that in order to lead, the US must create a vision of a spacefaring future in the mind of the electorate. Now I make a difference between this population and electorate, which can actually sustain multiple administrations. And I think another important point in that vision is that you need to acknowledge that the foundation of space uh, policy and space power and space governance is that space is about astroeconomic, and which means that we are talking about the economy that is worth trillions of dollars. And today it's no more about just prestige missions like the Apollo mission, where you went to show off a particular technology. Today it's about opening up space for access to citizens across the world. So it's a very different world where it's not just state institutions, it's multilateral engagements, it's different countries, different citizens of the world looking to the US for some kind of vision. So it's challenging. And I think I'll end by saying that when you talk about specifics in terms of that space policy, you're not just posturing to American citizens, you're actually posturing to the world in a, in a, in a large extent. And so multilateral engagements, including say engagements with countries like China and Russia. Uh, we saw that NASA collaborated with China uh, just recently with regard to its Mars mission because of the fact that there is the fear of collision. But then there are difficulties because of geopolitics where China also was not happy with NASA, including Taiwan as a country for collaboration. So I think I'll end with that, a vision, a very clear goal, and the willingness to recognize the economic potential of space, which is estimated to be in the trillions of dollars. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, just before we move forward, um, I just wanna welcome Tenyebi into the room and just give her a moment to introduce herself. And I'll go ahead and just repeat the question for her. And if um, either of you or anybody else wants to add anything to that, we'll go ahead. Excellent, thank you so much. I didn't hear the question, so you'll have to um, tell me what it is, but I'll just introduce myself first. So my name is Dr. Timia B. Aganova. I'm an assistant professor at the School for the Future of Innovation in Society with a courtesy appointment at the Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law at Arizona State University. I started my career 14 years ago as the Legal Affairs and International Corporation Officer at the Nigerian Space Agency, and since then have worked on space programs, um, space projects in France, in, in um, Canada, and um, in the US too. So I see myself as a bit of a global citizen. And um, my background is in space law and policy, though I focus now on governance because I think law um, which is my main background, is just one of the tools to figuring out how we will organize and coordinate our activities in space and primarily on Earth. Um, so I'm really interested in this discussion because I think America is, start, is slowly starting to open up and realize that this discussion about space, America can't do it alone. And it's important to um, partner with as many different allies all around the world. Um, I have a background in Africa specifically and in Europe. So I think um, looking at actors that we haven't classically thought of as spacefaring or space actors is going to be increasingly important because we don't know which way it's going to go. And I think it's important to get the right partnership started now at the beginning. So can you please remind me of the question, Jonathan? 
Yes, sure. Um, so the question was, how is the U.S. positioned globally and what is our immediate need in order to safely and securely lead? And um, just just to, to set the tone and everything there, you know, it's a it's a little bit of a free for all. So just as we move forward, uh, just feel free to jump in. OK, so I think I already started answering that question. Right. Um, you know, I see that NASA recently um, brought out an RFI request for information asking about how they can work with emerging nations and developing countries on technology development. Because we know, of course, the US has been doing a lot of work with developing countries on citizen science and data analytics and a lot of these softer areas. But the question is, how can America start partnering on the technological development? And where, where we're now seeing that the risk is less because of miniaturization and off the shelf technologies. Um, but definitely these countries. So for instance, the African experience that I have most experience with over the past 20, 30 years that they've been developing their capacity. I don't think the international cooperation agreements that they've gone into have been the best for the development of their programs. So I think the US is in a good position for once because the US isn't the bad guy. They haven't been there. And so the opportunity is now to figure out how can the US be a great service provider and a great partner by looking at all the lessons learned you know, I started working with the British when I was at the Nigerian Space Agency and we worked with the Chinese, other countries have worked with the Russians, you know, and I think maybe the the countries that they were working with at that time didn't have the capacity to know what is it, you know, you don't know what you don't know. But mm -hmm. now these countries are a position where they've had a bit of experience. And so I'm really excited about this RFI to try and give NASA some advice to say, what will developing countries and new actors be looking for from partnership and from collaborations? And how can it be a win-win moving forward? Awesome. Anybody else? Any, any comments on that one before we move forward? Yeah, sure. So um, I, uh, you know, I, I think that in order to really achieve you know, space safety, security, and sustainability, uh, we need to see how can we measurably make space more transparent? What's up there? Who does it belong to? What can it do? Um, how do we make it more predictable? Not just the physics, but given any common situation, how will any two, uh, you know, state actors behave when it comes to any of these things? And then can we develop a body of evidence that can be used to hold people accountable for their behaviors? Um, I, I, you know, people keep on talking about norms of behavior and all this other stuff. And I hear the US saying, oh yeah, you know, we wanna kind of be a part of this and maybe lead it. Look, um, when it comes to the knowledge about stuff in space and how to operate in space, that knowledge is extremely uneven across the spacefaring nations. Even across the NATO alliance itself, it's very uneven because you know I, I, I can attest to this personally because I've given lecture series as part of NATO and that sort of stuff. And I can tell you just going across different uh, NATO alliance members, the, the technical knowledge is very uneven. What does that mean? That implies that the practice is gonna be uneven. If the knowledge is uneven, the practice is uneven. And part of the issue is uneven practice. We want to, harmonize the practice. We want to make the practice more common. So that means that the knowledge has to be more common, which means that capacity building is critical. You know, uh, the United States is in a great position to lead if it really invests in the capacity building and actually tries to provide more evenness, at least in the scientific aspect of the knowledge about stuff in space and how to operate in space in that measure of making the knowledge more even, then norms of behavior can be you know, developed in parallel, which then make the practice more common. And that you know, definitely leads to uh, a more secure uh, uh, and, and safe and sustainable space environment. I think the last thing that I'd like to say is that people keep on talking about space laws and do we need more stuff? And I think the answer is no. Uh, we need to, first of all, understand how nation states interpret current treaties and conventions. I think that by and large is, has not been quantified. And then based on that, then have a, you know, inclusive dialogue about, you know, when, when we rent, you know, when we meant, uh, uh, you know, register your object as soon as it's practicable, we didn't mean five years after the thing was on orbit. We kind of met, you know, within the first few weeks and that sort of stuff, right? It's like, start, start having these kind of discussions. And I think U.S., uh, leadership could definitely uh, become salient 
if it starts taking these things like the long-term sustainability guidelines from UN COPOS and make that kind of, you know, a legal framework, uh, you know, within the U.S., part of the licensing uh, process and all that other stuff, and show other countries, hey, we hold our own people accountable. We are measuring how they're behaving in space. Whenever people are not complying with these things that we've basically made into U.S. space law, we're holding people accountable and there are consequences to their behavior. I think that's where the U.S. can demonstrate leadership. Awesome. Thank you. You know, I, I love where this is going and I'm going to I'm going to skip a couple questions uh, and because I think this is a great a great segue um, into one of one of the last ones I had for everybody. And um, I, I know we kind of hit already, but uh, just to dig a little deeper. And that's uh, what the developing countries, um, fast growing populations, African nations, um, what what suggestions can we offer to them? uh and support them uh economically and in regards to like workforce development and growing the economy so um a couple of lessons learned from the collaboration um, experiences of say african countries is that some of the partnership agreements that they went to into for instance were exclusive capacity building arrangements whereby you know, they could only work with the partner in which they'd contracted to help to develop their program. So they, they weren't able to partner kind of widely. Secondly, a lot of the collaboration opportunities didn't really take into consideration the need to have things on the ground. So yes, you can go abroad, you can develop capacity, but you're using the labs abroad and all that. And then when you come back home, there was not enough provision made for, well, what do you do when you come back and, and how do you use your own infrastructure? So I think, you know, some of the good collaboration opportunities will be, you know, really working with people to develop their programs. But the question actually then becomes what's in it, like why is, is America incentivized to help people really develop their capacity and become independent? Because all of these other collaboration opportunities have grown past dependencies and basically reliance on those countries. And if America was to come in as a good partner, it would be basically to say, we understand that you have your own aspirations. But I think it's really a soft power play to be able to help people develop independence in the space context, because you want these norms, uh, you want these norms to be upheld. You want people to, to grow their programs in a way that aligns with the vision that we have of how we see space moving, moving forward and, and our relationship with space. So I think it's it's in it's gonna be in the benefit of America in the long run, even if in the short term it looks like there's not a lot that they can get out because these partners are of unequal, um, unequal capacity. But I think from a soft power play standpoint and from a growing the norms and behaviors that we want in space, it behoves the US to basically enter into these partnership arrangements now. Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, if I may, that was great, uh, uh, Dr. Tibibi. Uh, I will speak a bit from the Asian side. So I think there are three ways that developing countries can actually develop themselves and make themselves attractive in terms of partnership. One, and this actually, uh, you know, Jonathan, your question that you pose in terms of what US states can do to attract more space and investment and infrastructure is not very dissimilar to what say a country like India or Indonesia or Thailand can do. So I think one thing is to develop a state-led financial infrastructure that actually incentivize their own uh, you know, citizens to invest in space. And this has happened to a very large extent in countries like Indonesia, uh, countries like India, where a new space sector has come up, but that is because incentive was provided. I think the second important thing is to create educational capacity within country. So for example, create chairs, create scholarships that encourages STEM education, because some of the uh, you know, technologies we are talking about in terms of artificial intelligence, 3D printing, if you're talking about in-space manufacturing, if you're talk talking about space economy, would require that kind of educational development. And I think finally, I would say that some of the countries in Asia are actually starting to do that also in terms of geographic location. So Indonesia actually is taking the lead 
So Indonesian President Widodo actually reached out to Elon Musk last year, uh, telling Musk that he should invest in Indonesia, especially because they're building a spaceport, because of Indonesia's strategic location being close to the equator, which means that you bring down the cost of launch. So the conversation coming out of Asian developing countries is that you need to invest in financial capability, resources. Second, uh, educate your workforce, especially students, send them to the International Space University, send them to universities in countries that offer very good education or develop collaborative educational capability. Third, build an ecosystem that actually uh, gives a regulatory framework that is incentivizing, not forcing uh, entrepreneurs to be caught in red tape. And this I say because I study the Indian and the Chinese uh, space ecosystem. And one of the uh, complaints, if I may, that come out is that the ecosystem is stifling because you have to go through a lot of red tape and bureaucracy to even establish a new startup. So because the ecosystem is changing, developing countries, especially their governments, need to also develop enabling infrastructure to build their own citizens so that they can then collaborate internationally. So I think I'll end there. Awesome. Thank you. And uh, yeah, go, go ahead. No, I mean, I, look, I, I think, uh, um, you know, the other panelists for sure um, said it quite well. So I'm, I'm no need to repeat that. Look, one of the things that I, I think is needed too is, you know, once the capacity uh, uh, building is, is done, um, you know, bringing, bringing students from Africa, for instance, to at least like in my own uh, research program here at UT Austin, then the question is, what are they going back to? Uh, you know, is there, is there a place that, that is receptive to the, the, the knowledge and the skill that they've developed where, where their stuff can be applied, where it's nurtured and that sort of thing? So I think it's, this is a long game. There's no, there's no it's, it's not, uh, it's, it's multi-generational. We're not talking about what we're going to, you know, in uh, several weeks or, 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 or months, um, you know, this is what's going to be achieved. Certainly we have to have milestones, but I think the commitment needs to be multi-generational. And, you know, I saw something regarding, you know, sharing versus competition and that sort of stuff. Um, look, I mean, you know, we're, we're as safe, we're as safe on a road as the, the least trained uh, driver, right? So the thing is, I'm not saying that, we need to be giving everybody Lamborghinis. We need to be showing people how to drive well. That's the thing that we need to do. So when I hear this stuff about, oh, you know, you're giving away the farm and, and basically it's a competitive edge. No, showing f other folks and helping them become awesome drivers is, is only builds uh, better safety for everybody else. You don't have to give him a, a Lamborghini, so. Awesome. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, I, I think I think uh, you know I, I like to dig deeper and a little bit about what the the space economy looks like um, on on kind of like a ground level and what it means for you know communities here and abroad. Um, talk to me about jobs. Talk to me about what is needed educational wise pathways programs. Uh, you know, for example, you know we we saw a huge boom in in cybersecurity and. You know, uh, we were a bit behind on that, and I think we're doing a really good job now. We're trying to catch up with uh, multiple programs out there. What is needed to to um, make sure that that you know we're staying ahead of the game and um, we're creating pathways? What what and what's the end result? What do these jobs look like on a very basic level um, that you know our our state governments and our communities can can start to visualize what we're talking about? So I think Mariba talks about this too, but um, transdisciplinarity is really important. Like we've got to get out of siloed thinking with respect to space, especially if it's really going to scale. And what we're doing at Arizona State University, for instance, is really exciting. We just had Greg Altry from, you know, the, he was recently um, appointed CFO of NASA, even though that didn't work out. He's just joined our faculty here at Thunderbird. You know, we have Lindy Elkins Tanton, who's leading the Psyche mission at NASA. We have myself working on space governance. And so we're really trying to say the next breed of, you know, entrepreneurs and innovators and people working on space. And 
not going to be able to just think of their little components. They're going to have to think of the wider ecosystem that what they're doing fits into if we're really going to scale. And so I think having that mindset from the beginning is really important. In Europe, you know, I went to the International Space University, as many people know, and that was such a fantastic oversight as to learning how to communicate and how to talk with different people, you know, working in the ecosystem. So I'm a lawyer and I remember doing group projects with scientists and engineers and, you know, it would be like everything you said because we use a lot of words in law so there would be like everything that you said needs to be in an in an in an interactive image and I'm like what the hell <laughs> how am I supposed to like have 10 pages of text in an image but just really learning how do the different fields work and communicate and giving our engineers those insights into how other people operate and how to communicate your needs and desires, I think is really going to see us a long way. So, so I mean, someone asked in the questions there about what European universities um, are, you know, are doing the right thing. I think the International Space University is a great way to um, to broaden out one's technical experience that they get from the programs that we do here, even if it's just the summer program rather than the full master's program. But I think slowly I'm seeing more and more transdisciplinary programs coming up in the US. And I think that's really the way to go forward. Though, of course, in transdisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity, you have to be a disciplinary expert too. So you have to, you know, you can't hide in, oh, I have an ecosystems approach. You also have to be an expert in something specifically. But just if you grow that mindset of always keeping your eyes open and looking at the different areas, I think you're really going to stand out in this new space era. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think uh, I think I think that was uh, well said, just to kind of follow up on what uh, Timiebi said is you know, wholeheartedly with the transdisciplinarians. Um, you know, I, 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 uh, um, I think that your question is interesting, because look, we don't say how is air creating more jobs? How is ocean creating more jobs? How's land creating more jobs? So to say how space is creating more jobs, I think is, I'm, and, and I'm not meant to, I'm not poking fun at you here, but it's a bit nonsensical. It's, it's not understanding how all these things are uh, interconnected, what the fabric is. I, mm -hmm. think, I, think, I think space basically opens up uh, uh, you know, scientific and technological advancements that, that, that permeate everyday life in, in, in a myriad of ways. And so I think, how does, so the question is, how does technology create more jobs, right? And the thing is space is just an additional uh, ecosystem, the lost pleiad of, of the ecological pleiades uh, to actually make contributions uh, to that in terms of uh, economy, in my opinion. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah, I think I would continue with that and say that, um, I think one of the reasons why we still think of space as this very unique, unreachable domain is because not all of us have access to it. It's still a very elite focus, just astronauts. I don't get to go to space and easily access space. Like I can fly on a plane and get to India if I want. And that's what some of the uh, countries and private are trying to do. They're trying to bring down the cost of launch so, so that people like me can dream uh, of ever going to space if you want to and can afford it. But coming to your specific questions, Jonathan, I'm glad you sent it in advance because I kind of uh, thought through what could we need if we are talking about, say, a future where we are thinking about in-space manufacturing, you know, developing space-based solar power, for example. Uh, so I think one of the jobs that I could think of, which actually gets me out of a job because I'm more in, uh, you know, policy and international relations, but we always have our utili utility because we bring the whole picture together. But if you're talking about specifics, I think I would say that you would probably need a machine learning engineer for space traffic management, very specifically. Uh, you would require a planetary geologist if you're thinking about studying Mars and Moon surfaces in the future. Uh, you would require a thermal engineer if you're talking about space-based solar power satellites. Uh, you know, and if you're talking about, uh, for example, self-replicating lunar systems in the future, you are probably thinking about a physical design optimization engineer for which mathematics is critical. So uh, if you're talking about, and since you asked me that question, what are the specific jobs we are, requir we are required to do? Now, one of the technologies that I get uh, insights into, in which I don't specialize, is 3D printing. 
but I include it in my analysis because I think that's going to have deep impact on nations and society's capability to even sustain a presence on the moon, for example, robotically, if not via humans, then we might require a person like an operator who is good at that. And so those are the specific jobs that I could think of in terms of just technology. Now, in terms of the legal regulatory regime, a person like Timothy, who uh, specializes in that, is absolutely required. Uh, you know, uh, someone who understands the astropolitics and the geopolitics of it. Uh, I have been in sessions where, uh, for example, in Mountain View, uh, in NASA Ames Park, where I am told about exponential technologies uh, and their amazing contribution to humanity without realizing the geopolitical and the other implications of it. Because that's not what, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can expect an entrepreneur or a designer to really think about because they are specific domain focused and I understand that. So someone like me then comes into the picture. So I think I'll end there. But by, by the way, I, wa I wanted to tell Namrata that uh, there's this thing called Space Hero, which gets somebody like you to go into space. So you don't have to dream about this is something, you know, only accessible by billionaires. You can you can do it. It's going to come out soon. I want to see you participate in that. <laughs> How much is it all in terms of um, my my bank account is not big. <laughs> no, no, no. So so no. So this is really quick not to derail this, but. It's a game show where people are going to compete and the winner gets to go to the space station for a week. That could be you. It's really funny because one of my followers basically, because I very recently announced that I wanted to be an astronaut. And this has been, you know, coming from a developing country space program, an astronaut was just the last thing on my mind. You know, you, you're when you come from a developing country space program, everyone is saying you don't even have electricity. You know, why are you talking about space? So the last thing on my mind would be astronauts and the last thing I would avoid as astronauts. But really, I mean, I'm on the board of Worldview Enterprises with Kathy Sullivan, and she's the she was the first woman, American woman to walk in space and go to the bottom of the sea and be the administrator for NOAA. And working with her and seeing like the kind of astronauts who are not just astronauts they're kind of really doing amazing things practical things and then space is just that extra aspirational things i really started thinking hmm, what would it mean to have an african astronaut not just mark shuttleworth the white south african man but like a black female like myself from africa and one of my followers was like Yes, a lawyer going to space, especially now in this context of, of the geopolitics and like the potential for conflict. Now we're in the era of space forces. What would it mean to have kind of experiments happening in space? So they're talking about how do we continue that space station era-esque of working together despite, you know, trying to find resources and all that. So it could be interesting to have the first black African female space lawyer, just saying. Yeah, I think I'll quickly add to that. You got me thinking, Timmy B. So I recently gave a talk uh, via Zoom, and that is why I think Zoom is so enabling or, or the kind of virtual conversations we have. So I was having a conversation with a girls' college in one of the most remote areas of Northeast India, which is cut off from the rest of India because of monsoons most of the time. And I asked the girls, so these are girls between the age of uh, 16 and 18. And so I asked them, I, and I was talking on space and what space is, uh, is uh, about and, and their aspirations a bit. And so I asked them, what would you like to do if you, uh, you know, in, in the next uh, five, six years? And all of them said, we want to go to space. <laughs> we, want to, uh, we want to get uh, involved in the space economy. After, of course, they heard me talk about the importance of space economy and critical infrastructure. And but the, what was so insightful for me was that when I asked them what inspired them, uh, they said SpaceX and Elon Musk. It was not NASA. It was not the Indian Space Research Organization, but what Mars did and his life story. And I think that does not get reflected in some of our discourses here. The changes in who inspires uh, women or men in remote areas and who are they actually looking at. And I think that's something that we should start capturing uh, as well. So I thought I would put that on the table. That's interesting. It kind of, and I, I think maybe, I mean, not to, to dig into it too much, but I think, you know, looking back, someone mentioned like the Cold War, uh, uh, you know, kind of era, we're not there anymore. And, you know, I, I think, uh, 
you know, back then that was, you know, it was a, just expiring just to be able to get to that point in that era. And, and then going to the Elon Musk thing, I mean, that's the, that's the new generation, right. And it's showing what a, a single individual can do, um, you know, versus a enormous, you know, institution or agency. All right. Um, I think, uh, I think I want to dig a little bit deeper in something that Mariba said, and that's the talking about infrastructure. Um, you know, and and me coming from the the, the state side, um, what can what can states be doing to to pair for the technology right advancements like the infrastructure uh, to support you know um, uh, space stations, sp spaceports, any any of those chips, supply chain systems, anything that is needed, um, because you know we're all we're all going to try to compete. Um, you know, just like every other industry. So what should states be focusing on right now to uh, be competitive, uh, at least amongst each other and support the industry and, and get the growth that they want to be a, to be a key player? Hmm, that is a tough question. I know that, um, that Kalis Partners, um does a lot of work on the state level just like trying to figure out how can we build ecosystems on the state level and even you know here in arizona how you know we have quite a few different actors who are interested in the supply chain and the space but i can't really speak much to that but as an academic i would say that you know getting support for space programs on the educational level is really, really important and trying to develop pockets of excellence in different areas. Um, but, but I think the interesting thing is talking about co-optition is that we should have a lot more collaboration. So on the space governance side, there are very few people that talk about, you know, I'm a lawyer, but like, what is space governance? What does that even mean? And so at Texas, um, you know, I'm working with someone called Justin Bullock, who's like developing this grand vision for space governance. Um, they're gonna develop this institute and everything. And it's really interesting just talking and being like, how can we, yes, we're in our different states and we're doing different things and we're trying to get leadership in each one of those areas. But I think at the end of the day, we need to still think pretty macro and just be like, you know, how do we come together? Because it's the working together, it's the collaborations that are gonna make us stronger, you know, generally. So I don't really have much to say on that, um, but Kayla's Partners is a really good, Kalis Foundation and Kalis Partners are really good people to, to talk to about that. Yeah, I, I guess the thing that, uh, you know, I'd like to, to kind of reiterate, which was bringing it back to um, not thinking specifically about how do we, you know, do this whole infrastructure for space is more about uh, looking at life in general, right, with, with, with the earth. How do we live more sustainably? How do we improve uh, everybody's lives? How do we behave in way, ways that are more ecologically friendly and less impactful and all that other stuff? And then once we can start putting that vision out, then the question is, how does space enable achieving those things, right? Then I think you have a path to developing stuff for space. But I see some people that kind of do the whole thing in reverse. They're just like... Uh, it's almost like this desperation of, I need to launch something. Well, what does your thing do? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I just miniaturize. I'm going to just demonstrate some tech. It's going to be a technology demonstrator. And I'm going to blah, 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 blah. And it's like, it's just this, this rattling, this, this incoherent mumble that just, it, you know, it just doesn't make sense. And so people that are just trying to do stuff in space for the sake of it, uh, where there's no real, um, there's no real vision for how it improves the lives of humans and all this other stuff. And, helps us be better custodians of, of, you know, our environments. I think, I think, I think that's the mistake. So, you, you know, getting into a little bit of a, you know, a little bit greater detail, I think, I, you know, I think to your point, I, I think um, what probably a lot of, you know, policymakers and economic development leaders are, are, um, you know, probably asking like, you know, the, the big, what can we do that, you know, to play our part, to do our part, and um, 
uh, uh, someone had mentioned before that geographically, um, you know, if you're along the equator, you know, you're going to save, you know, save fuel costs, I believe. And um, so, like, you know, I think for policymakers and, and uh, you know, they're asking themselves, like, where, where's the, the scientific, you know, um, advantages for us where there's sustainability, where, if we're on a coastline, you know, where can we be um, really just doing our part to, to um, be successful, right? I mean, maybe if, if, if you're a border state, maybe your part is um, somewhere between supply chain systems with, with Mexico or Canada because there's manufacturing somewhere outside of the US. Um, so I, I just want to kind of pose that and, and just leave it open for comment. Yeah, I mean, I mean, look, ver very quickly, right? It's like, um, I think of, of, of technology uh, being helpful in two ways. One is, is how, how does it how does it remove your need to do things that 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 otherwise you could spend more time with family or doing things that you're actually passionate about and, and fun and these sorts of things? So technology to help do that, basically improve quality of life. And then two, uh, how does technology really deliver on decision intelligence? How do you manipulate information and data that leads to desired outcomes? So to me, those are the two big nuggets. And of course, space has a big role, right? And being able, we're talking about like quantum computing and these sorts of things, the ability to, to gather, collect data from different vantage points and basically, uh, you know, given decision-making criteria, I kind of at the speed of relevance for, 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 for uh, uh, the sake of, of being jargony, at the speed of relevance, be able to deliver abilities to make decisions um, in a very timely manner that lead to desired outcomes. I think that's the way we need to look at how to leverage space. Yeah, I think I'm going to say that's critical, uh, desired outcomes. So what are we doing? First, we, we game out or we think through what the desired outcomes should be, what is most likely and what is probable, and then actually work backward. But I think to answer your question, uh, if you're talking about states, I live in Alabama, not very far away from the Huntsville uh, Space uh, you know, Center, which is, an, which is fantastic to go in uh, to the museum. But I think um, specifically, if you're thinking from the policymakers perspective uh, or the society perspective uh, and space critical role in it uh, today, I don't have to repeat what those amazing technologies that space brings to us, GPS being one of them, uh, I think there are four infrastructures that are required. One is financial infrastructure. So state policies that allow investing in space infrastructure as infrastructure. I think I might be wrong, but I don't think the US uh, has included space as a critical infrastructure as yet. But correct me, I, I, have, I don't have the latest information on that. The second is educational infrastructure. So states can create specialized programs in developing sectors, especially highlighting those areas in the space economy. Uh, I was thinking, what could that be specifically that could be endowed chairs, undergraduate and graduate programs that includes not just STEM, but as Timmy B was saying, interdisciplinary kind of education where space is brought in. Uh, I'm going to speak to a school in Alabama, to, to high school uh, you know, students about the importance of space in their lives and what it brings. And I think that kind of educational awareness is critical as well. Security infrastructure, so states who have U.S. citizens or U.S. persons should have a way of understanding the supply chain and actually create an ecosystem or an app, for example, which some of the uh, Silicon Valley uh, you know, startups are trying to do that actually gives information of where the contracts are. That's something that uh, we grapple with. Okay, what are the contracts? How do you bid? How do you get through the difficult process of even getting the contracts because you need security clearances for some of them. Uh, physical infrastructures, universities to include minority universities that actually develop expertise uh, in space uh, you know, topics, which I don't find as uh, open in remote areas, even in Alabama, if you go in. And I think, for example, I could think of the NASA Ames Research Park uh, in Mountain View that creates that system where you actually have different 
uh, entities going and starting their businesses there or their you know outlets there. So something like that, for example, in India, so India is known to be a hub of cybersecurity and software development including services. And so one of the way that India has been able to do that is actually to develop very specific uh, zones, uh, Hyderabad being one of them in South India. I come from the Northeast of India, so we do not have that kind of outlet as well. And I recognize the consequences of that for students especially, but for South India, you have that. And that has actually attracted a lot of talent and, and have uh, ensured uh, continuity of jobs security. So I think those are the kind of infrastructures that US states require to invest in if you want to build that ecosystem for space. And I think talking about, um, like it's really complicated when we start talking about um, launch facilities and, and space ports and all this because of you know the question of demand. So on Clubhouse, which is this new social media kind of app that is audio based. There's a lot of space discussions there. And the VCs are always talking about, we're not gonna fund technological developments because as Mariba said, it's really people just coming up with all this demonstrations and things like that. They're right, we really need to figure out the applications. So what are we gonna do with space? What are we gonna do with all this data? And what are we gonna do with what we already have? So, so I think that could be a lot of support that goes into you know, doing stuff with what we already have. And this is kind of on the African, you know, on the African side where it's just like, what can these actors do as well as developing capacity and building the technologies? It's like, what do you do once you've got that? And, and, you know, I, and even though I'm from Nigeria, and of course, I'm interested in looking at countries like Nigeria and South Africa, my best friends in Africa are people like Rwanda and Angola and people who are really like, you know, do like young people like the Rwandan Space Agency, they're all under 40. And they just have this plan to like, you know, in the, over the next five years, build their 60 to 100 scientists and engineers basically focus on startups and those startups will have to go to other countries and develop their projects and then if they work well they'll come back and the angola government will seed fund you know the, to scale up their projects so it's just really like figuring out okay yes space is this grand goal but what exactly about space or what are you going to do that is actually going to be relevant so i think that's more important than thinking of it's easy to be like yeah let's have another launch site but there's so many and the vcs are not funding those maybe maybe government is not is supposed to be funding the things the vcs and you know other funders won't be funding but it's like what is actually viable is what we should focus on yeah and i think uh continuing with that i think one of the insights I got from understanding space ecosystem is the regulatory mechanism is critical. Uh, I'll give you an example of Indian space startups because the Indian regulatory mechanism was so difficult to even have a, a particular, for example, a friend of mine is working on enabling broadband, broadband connectivity to remote areas in India. They want to launch satellites. It was so difficult to navigate the Indian uh, ecosystem because of lack of clear transparency, which Moriba was talking about, that uh, Indian startups started incorporating in Europe and started to look for global cooperation because of the lack of it. I don't know about African countries to maybe if they have very clear regulatory mechanisms that enable their space startups, but India didn't have that. Uh, and so today, of course, because of realization that they've been losing talent, the Indian government has come up with a new space limited, which enables a one-stop clearance process, a, a, a lesson learned that you do not want to lose people to outside. Turkey recently announced a space program and wants to go to the moon by 2023. Guess what the reason for Erdogan to come up with that? And he talked to Musk as well, is because Turkey was losing talent. To the world and there were I, I have conversations with my Turkish colleagues and all of them despair at the lack of any serious conversations around the space ecosystem and them wanting to then leave the country and so the countries recognize that now and as is starting to establish ecosystem so I think regulatory mechanisms uh, especially in the countries we are talking about uh, Somalia is very much located in an advantageous position as well close to the equator but what is it doing to then benefit and create that ecosystem is also key. And I think you got to that to maybe uh, in, your, in your point, but um, it'll, be, it'll be critical in the next five, 10 years to actually develop the internal regulatory systems as well. And I'm sure it's happening. 
uh, you know it much more than me. So I'll leave it there. Yeah, I think that's really important. And like, because I worked for the Nigerian government for a second, um, sometimes, you know, I hear all the complaints from, you know, people saying, oh, they're not supporting us and all this. And I have to remind people, Nigeria is not doing a good job at kind of of also explaining that they have they like they have international responsibility and liability for private activities in space so unlike other areas of international law whereby there's not direct attribution of the activity of the state on of, of the actors onto the state in space is different so the country has to be really prepared to to be like okay we will just let you guys kind of go free the other thing in the in, in the african context is that for instance the manfred lack space law moot which is a big international law moot competition never had African participation. I was able to, to help get the African regional rounds of the competition started out. And I remember Nigeria was just like, oh my God, if we tell the young people they can do this, they're all going to want to apply. And then, you know, how are we going to be able to actually get them to be in the competition? Because we have the numbers, we have the enthusiasm, we have the youth. It's almost like they're also afraid that if they open the floodgates, they're going to be overwhelmed. But my message to them is always, you need to do a better job communicating that because all people are gonna see is that you're not supporting them. So I really feel that as time goes and as these countries you know, have more understanding of what is this space domain that's happening? What is the geopolitical geopolitics around it? How can we you know, support our private sector and keep them in check? But even in the US context, if we look at what happened you know, with, with a couple of actors the other day with the um, with the um, tardigrades in space and then the others who um, launched without the license, you know, it's hard to keep private actors in check. And so, and for these developing countries, they know that they're going to get a heavy hand from the rest of the world if they get it wrong. So, you know, most of the time I'm, I'm for the citizens and saying, yes, the government needs to do more. But the rest of the time I'm like, okay, give, just give the government some time to because they have global responsibility for these activities. Terrific. That was great. That was great, everybody. Um, so like on that note, I'm just curious, like, you know, can we to, can we talk a little bit about vulnerabilities? Like, let's let's talk about security and, um, you know, what we might be facing with with all this growth. Like what what needs what what should we be cognizant of as, as we move forward? And, um, you know, as, as Tanyebi said, you know, with the, uh, we know that we got to get it right, right? Whether we're in the US or in a developing country, like what should we be watchful of? I mean, I think the first thing that's coming up to my top of my head is if we're going to have the, I don't want to say mega constellations because that's the wrong terminology. Um, but, you know, if we are going to have this exponential growth in activities, we have to start thinking about space traffic management and, um, and it's really interesting because as part of the International Institute of Space Law, I'm on a working group and my focus is on the African region. So I'm talking to the Africans. Do you guys have a perspective on space traffic management? What should we do? And the feedback I get is when you have less assets in space, are you really focused on, you know, thinking about this as a topic? But then it's interesting because. I'm like the people that have the most assets in space also you know have they been moving forward on this topic too and it's kind of just been easier for them to do things like the space data association which is the groupings of actors who come together and think of themselves but I think you need to think of the whole ecosystem and 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 to ensure that space remains accessible we've got to start thinking about what these rules of the road are what the space traffic management system should look like and um and I, and I think if we don't do that before activities get or before more and more actors come in, it's just going to get more and more complicated as we move forward. Yeah, I mean, I, I will I will say this, um, you know, echoing what Tamiabi just said is that um, right now we have we there's no way that we can predict what the environmental impact of our behaviors are in space. We can't do that. Uh, near Earth space is. Uh, it's a complex system uh, in that um, the, 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 the causal relationships are mostly unknown. Some of the ones that we do know, small causes can have huge consequences, so it's very nonlinear. We have a, an, a, 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 
a growing group of participants that are making decisions in the absence of knowing the decision-making criteria of other people. So that's a big issue. Um, we also, we also uh, don't fully understand the effects and impacts of the space environment on how these objects behave and operate and all that other stuff. Um, we don't know how people are interpreting common treaties and conventions and things like that. And it's a finite resource, meaning we, we only put satellites in very specific orbital highways or zip codes, and these things are becoming more saturated. We, we have no idea what saturation means in terms of orbital carrying capacity for any one of these orbital highways. So we, ha we don't have sustainability metrics in place. We don't even have something like a carbon footprint analog, like a space traffic footprint to understand the burden that any given object that are alive poses on the safety and sustainability of other stuff. This is all to say we have a tragedy of the commons that will happen. A tragedy of the commons will happen unless we do something different, unless we manage this finite resource holistically. I can tell you this too. Um, you know, I'm not a big fan of this whole Kessler syndrome thing. Like I don't believe in the, you know, ad infinitum, a uh, uh, runaway train of, of cascading collisions, you know, forever. Because I believe that when, uh, when humanity stops inputting stuff into a system, mother nature always seeks equilibrium. My scientific uh, experience tells me that. COVID happened. What was one of the first things that we saw? Oh, wow. Animals that we never saw are coming back out and, you know, being around people. When, when the pandemic happened, what else did we see in Venice? Oh, now we can actually see all the way through to the bottom of the canals. So the thing is, if we stopped launching satellites every three weeks, we might get a clue of what the equilibrium state of the near Earth space ecosystem looks like so that we could use that empiricism to then guide a regulatory framework that could be international and, and, and to understand how we need to further participate in this environment so that sustainability is a desired outcome that's achievable. But I think this whole race to, to orbital space to claim to claim you know orbital highways as de facto real estate uh, deeds, I think is the wrong thing. The fact that nobody's slowing down and we're just like saying yes, license and uh, unhindered use of space, I think is gonna be to our detriment. Yeah, I think I would say there, are, there is one thing that gives me hope and that is that when I saw that uh, NASA collabor at least uh, offered data on its Mars mission to the China National Space Administration, that's the start because they were worried about collision and that's space traffic management. So that's, that's a start. We can think about such transparency when it comes to debris. How do you uh, track debris? How do you actually uh, share data on that? And I think that's one way to go. Uh, the second vulnerability that I see in terms of the future is that space continues to, despite our conversation about it being a global common, that humanity somehow forgets nationalism when you get to space, space programs of countries continue to be very nationalistic. You listen to the Indian space program, it's all about nationalism and prestige. The Chinese space program is very much about that. So is the US, American astronauts from American soil on American rockets, you hear that. So, uh, so I think it's very important to realize that it continues to remain that. And for me, uh, coming from India, one of the big uh, wake up call was the COVID-19 crisis. So when COVID happened, which is a global pandemic, we saw that countries turned inwards, citizens first, closed borders, citizens get the vaccines first. So you can see that in a crisis, humanity actually turned inwards to, to a large extent and then once they had it under control, for obvious scientific reasons, uh, there is now this international collaboration. So my concern is that what happens when you have a permanent presence, say, on the lunar surface? Uh, China Russia just signed a memorandum of understanding to establish a research base on the lunar south pole, which is going to be a permanent presence. Now, you know, to maybe the question that came to me, and given I don't have a legal background, but a policy background, is that the Outer Space Treaty, if I remember right, says that every area should have access to everyone in space. It's free for all. So what happens when you have a permanent base by one country, uh, uh, which is actually there forever and has scientific experiments that they are collaborating on, and then somebody else wants to land there? What happens then? 
you know, because the Outer Space Treaty obligation tells you one thing, but then permanent presence means something very different, which the OST probably did not uh, think about when it was uh, conceptualized in 1966 and made into a treaty in 1967. So I think those kind of futures are what uh, uh, I think about in terms of policy and, and what we are facing. And I think we need to uh, grapple with that, given the fact that there is this rush for to go to the moon by several countries, uh, including Japan and India. And I think I'll end there. Can I just quickly, quickly, because I know we've got to end, speak to something. So it's interesting, Article 12 of the Outer Space Treaty says that, so basically everyone is supposed to have access to everyone's installations but on the basis of reciprocity, which I find quite fascinating because it means that you can say you can't come here because you don't have an equal like facility. So, so there's always ways that you can, you can actually prevent people from doing things, you know, like legally, it sounds like, yeah, all installations should be open on the basis of reciprocity, you know? So you've always got to see like the rest of the sentence <laughs> whenever you're reading legal stuff. Awesome. Well, uh, before we log off, we just got about a minute left. I just want to um, quickly uh, ask each of you um, if there's anything that you take to heart that you feel that our viewers should walk away with today. And I'll start from the top, uh, Dr. Goswami, if something that's absolutely critical for our viewers to take away that means a lot to you. Yeah, I think the one point that I cannot emphasize enough is that the uh, space has changed. It's no more the 1960s and the 70s, where you had two states literally dominating space, and it was based on a very competitive uh, discourse and treaties coming out of that particular competition. Uh, I think space today is getting more open. Uh, you have several actors with space agencies today, uh, ambitions to go to space, including the private sector. And I think we need to factor that in, into our future. Yeah, what the last one's doing there. And I think uh, I'll end by saying, uh, if your audiences have not watched The Expanse, I think it's a great series that talks about a, a geopolitical future in space. I'll end there, thank you. All right. Looks like uh, it's time to, sorry for the, the last two, but um, I'll go ahead and pass it back over to you, Murray. Oh, hey, uh, great to see you, sir. Uh, fascinating conversation. I'd love for you guys to go ahead and finish up. You had a couple of the people that were going to share their uh, sort of takeaways. That would be great. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, go ahead, Marita. Yeah, okay. So I, I think the big takeaway is this, right? Um, space is just another ecosystem that humanity needs to embrace along with land, air, and oceans. Um, I would like for the viewers to really uh, consider the hypothesis that all things are interconnected and, and honor that interconnectedness and not try to drive us towards unity because unity doesn't make sense. We should celebrate our diversity and differences. I think we need to drive towards harmony. Harmony is achievable. Unity is not, and everything's interconnected and honor that. So um, I know I know in America, you guys talk about us being in the space 2.0 era, but I always followed the European Space Agency's characterization that we were in the 4.0 era. And I just gave a talk at McGill last week that we're actually in the space 5.0 era, which has ethics, law and governance at the center. And the four main trends that I've been watching in this 5.0 era is basically resisting the structures of coloniality. So we're not saying that there's colonialism in space, but we're saying there's a logic of coloniality when we talk about frontiers and things like that. We need to operationalize equity. So what does it really mean to have fairness and justice in the context of these activities? How do we mainstream space by bringing in non-space people and non-space discussions into space discourse? And fourth, how do we have competing legal orders such that polycentric governance applies? So I really think that now in the space 5.0 era where ethics is the main thing that we're thinking about how do we as engineers and scientists you know get more on, on board that those things are really important thank you awesome thank you everybody for for um for participating today this has been an amazing discussion 
I, I'm really proud of everybody here. I think we were able to talk to a very broad audience, which is like just super. So thanks for um, popping in for us today.